Uh, good morning to you all. Good morning. God's good, isn't he? So if you've got uh, your Bibles with you or the technology that uh, you guys use today, um, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through to 16. That's Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through to 16. And it says this. It says, not that I've already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, then too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. The athletics match had reached a critical stage, and one of the final races was left to be run, the 440 yards. And the athletes, they were bunched together as they came to the first bend. And one of them was pushed over and he fell off the track. And his name was Eric Lidl. But as quick as a flash, he was back on his feet. And as though he was electrically charged, he caught the other runners up and then he went on to win the race. And the race was a famous victory and it featured in the movie Chariots of Fire. And it was a race meeting between Scotland and France and the year was 1923. And Eric, even though he was born in uh, China, he was actually from Scottish descendants. And so he was a Scot, really, and he was running for his country. Then in the year 19, 1924, the Olympic Games would have been held in Paris. And Eric, he was chosen to run for Great Britain. Now Eric, he was a Christian, he was a God-fearing man, and he wouldn't race on a Sunday. And his favourite distance was the 100 yards. But as the heats were being run on a Sunday, he said, I will not compete. So instead he chose once again to run the 440 yards, which took place on a weekday. Which incidentally, he then went on to win, and to win an Olympic medal. And then after his victory in the Olympics, he went back again to be a missionary once more in China, where he stayed until his death in 1945. But let's just go back, shall we, to the event meeting in Scotland, which was Scotland v France. And what would most of us have done at that event? had we fallen like he did, I think that we would have accepted, don't you, that our race was over and that we wasn't going to win. But not Eric Liddell. It was as though he'd been reading this passage that we just read, forgets what's behind, strain every nerve to go after what's ahead and chase on towards the finishing line. In the passage, Paul says that his goal is to know Christ, to be like Christ, and to be all that Christ has in mind for him. And this goal it absorbs all of Paul now is, and all of his energies. And this is a very helpful example 
for each and every one of us. So we should not let anything take our eyes off the goal. We should be like Eric Little and be single minded on the race. We are to have the mind of an athlete that is in training and we are to go on to win the prize. So we are to lay aside anything that is harmful and we are to forsake anything that may distract us from being the effective Christians that Jesus Christ wants each and every one of us to be. You see, Paul, he had a reason to forget what was behind. If you remember, he had held the coat or the coats of those that had stoned Stephen. And at one point we can read in Acts chapter 9 that he was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples and he asked the high priest for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so if he found anyone there who belonged to the way as it was called in those days he might take them prisoners back to Jerusalem. Now we've all done things haven't we for which we are ashamed but because our hope is now in Christ Jesus, we can let go, and we are to let go of our past guilt. And we are to look forward to what God has in store for each and every one of our futures. We must forget our shame. Paul, he could have been a prime candidate, couldn't he, for shame, over the harassment, the imprisonment, and the torture and getting involved in the murderous acts of innocent human beings. But God's grace is stronger than our shame. It was defanged when Jesus died and then he rose again. We've just celebrated that, haven't we? And we can forget our slithering shame for Jesus took it. He scorned it. He beat it right here. And we need not, and he doesn't want us to take it back again. But then sometimes, trying to live a perfect Christian life, it can be so difficult, can't it? It can leave us feeling drained and discouraged. And it can make us feel so far from being perfect. But Paul here, he uses the word perfect to mean mature or complete, not flawless in every detail. He means that those who are mature should press on in the Holy Spirit's power, knowing that Jesus will reveal and fill in any discrepancy between what we are and what we should be. Christian maturity involves acting on the guidance that you have already received. We can always make excuses, can't we? We all have so much that we all need to learn. And we can all so easily get ourselves sidetracked, knocked off the track, if you like. But the instruction is for us to live up to what we already know. What God has already taught us and live out what we have already learnt. Now Paul several times uses this image in his letters of a race. It was an image that would have been very familiar to the Greeks and the Romans who prized athletic prowess and chariot racing. Every major town, in fact, would have had a stadium which athletes would have competed against one another. And the winner of the race, he would have been given a prize. And it would have been a laurel crown that he would have had on his head. And sometimes there even was cash rewards as well for the winner. And for Christians, the finishing line means heaven. And the prize means eternal life with Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
But like all athletes, we must keep. And Jesus wants us to keep on training. Keep on learning. Keep on striving to make every performance the best performance that we can for Jesus. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 3, Paul says there, he says, You are running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? And then he goes on to say, Little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. So let me ask you this morning, those watching online, do you have a reoccurring temptation that is difficult to resist? If so, remove yourself physically from any situation that stimulates your desire to sin. Knowing when to run is as important in a spiritual battle as knowing when and how to fight. Running away is sometimes considered cowardly, isn't it? But wise people, they realise that removing themselves physically from temptation often can be the most courageous action that they can take. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11, Paul is speaking there, and he's speaking to Timothy, and he's speaking to him about money. And he says this to Timothy, he says, you man of God, I love that, man of God, you man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. So why have I told you all of this this morning? It's because you've come a long way. <coughs> and God, he doesn't want you to forget that. He doesn't want you to forget the race that you've been running. And he most definitely doesn't want you to give up on your race now. Of course, we're to look back on our lives and we're to reflect on the milestones that have brought us to where each and every one of us is today. They're important, aren't they? They are pillars that have helped to shape us into what each and every one of us is today. But like Paul, our focus isn't to be on our past. He says that whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. But sometimes... Before we look forward, it is good just to take a glance over our shoulder and look back. Especially when we're looking at what God has done in each and every one of our lives. Then we can see our future in Him far more clearly. Both as individuals we can do this, and also as a body of the church. So having just said all of that, Let's just take a very quick look back, shall we, at what God has done with this church over the last 12 months. In fact, we've spoken a lot, haven't we, over the last couple of years about the Lord doing a new thing here at Living Water Church. And it's been exciting, hasn't it, to see what God has been doing during that time. As I've just said, I believe that God would say, you've come a long way. And he has enhanced the faith of the believers within this church. And he's encouraged individuals to step up into doing things that they never dreamt that they would or be possible. We can all hold our hands to that one, can't we? New people have come into the fold of this church. People who are already Christians and they've just moved into this area. And people who have come to Christ, who have lived here for many years, have now come and joined and become part of this flock. Amen. So as well as having the amazing privilege of people being saved, we've had baptisms. And they've been amazing and incredible. We've done them over in the Mediterranean over there. 
the best path to have going. <laughs> Just not at the moment. And we've seen amazing healings. And we've heard of amazing healings. All of which we thank God for. So we have seen growth, not only in new people coming to Christ, but great growth in seeing individuals growing and maturing in Jesus Christ himself. And one of the major things that we did, I believe, was having the prayer and fasting day here each and every first Wednesday of the month. And it gave us a real focus, I believe, on God. And it, it helped us to say, God, we're serious here. We mean this. It said that we have really want to hear from you, Jesus Christ. And we really want, as a church, to do your will. We want your direction over this house and over its people, the church. And many people have joined in with this, whether they live here in Spain or back in the UK or whichever home country you might be in. And because of it, we have seen God move. So I want to say a big thank you to everyone who got involved with doing that through this year. Thank you. You see, God, he has moved within individual lives by encouraging people to step up and to believe that he is able. He has moved with people bringing prophetic words. We've had many prophetic <coughs> words that come over this church. We want that to continue. If the Lord uses you for that, be encouraged and ask all the more for God to use you. And amazing healings. It's interesting what you pray. I've already wrote down here, Jim and Ian. For people who don't know, we've been praying for Jim. Katie went home for Christmas to find that her father had fallen down the stairs and had a dreadful, dreadful accident and was seriously, seriously ill. But with prayer, but with prayer, yeah, it's wonderful what the doctors and nurses can do. But let's remember, God's put them in place. Amen. So the wonderful people that have taken care of him. Jim is coming out of the woods, isn't he? He's got a long way to go, but he's coming out of the woods. Man of God. A man of God. And then with Ian. I personally don't know Ian, but I've seen what we've been discussing about him through the WhatsApp app that we have. But Ian really was at a place where we really felt there's no way forward really for this guy other than him. But the last report seems to be so much more healthier and a chance, the chance is for his life here on planet Earth. So Lord, we just thank you for Jim. We thank you for Ian. We thank you for the families. We thank you what you're doing here, touching your people, healing your people. Thank you, Father God. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So let us be a people who continue to run the race that is set before each and every one of us. You see, because we all have such a massive part to play. I've said this so many times before, it's not the chosen few. It's each and every person has a massive part to play. As together as the body of Christ, we see this church grow both spiritually as well as numerically. So let's be prepared to step it up again this year, Amen. together as a family of God. But don't let's rush ahead, let's just do it one step at a time, in tune where Jesus wants us to be and to go. Amen.